I apologize for the fact that the screen behind me does not have good enough resolution to show my slides. Uh, I, I hate lecturing from slides. I try not to. In this case, I would be happy if I had uh, if I had the ability to to, sh to show slides, but it's very difficult. So if necessary, I will use my own body as a visual aid. Um, my aim here is to talk about Salvatore Fabris as an individual a little bit, his way of fencing a little bit, and the context in which I think Fabris and his theories of rapier fencing fit into 16th century rapier fencing more broadly. And so I will start talking about this 16th century subject in the 14th century. Now, first of all, let's introduce myself. My name is Lynette Nussbacher. I teach at School of the Sword um, in Godalming in England, in the south of England. And we are about, let's say, 30 miles, which is damn all used to you, 50 kilometers southwest of London. And we're a lovely bunch of people to fence with. And you should come when you're in England and fence with us on a Wednesday night in, uh, in Godalming, on a Thursday night in Reading. Um, no, uh, a Tuesday night in Reading, and on a, a Thursday night in Oxford. And um, I also fence in the SCA. I've been an SCA fencer uh, for, uh, for only about 10 years, um, and I've been in that club for 40 years, so I've been uh, kicking around a bit. And um, I approach the idea of 16th century fencing in, I hope, in its historical context. My background is as an historian. Um, my doctorate is in early modern history, particularly the history of armies and the way they feed themselves, their logistics. Um, I am very oriented towards culture, but also towards technology in history. And that will maybe show a little bit in this discussion. Um, but I said I was going to start in the 14th century. In about 1300, Johannes Lichtenauer was born. And in about 1304, Francesco Petrarca was born. Petrarch, as he is called in English. So at about the time that Johannes Lichtenauer was creating his obscure system of, uh, of longsword fencing, Francesco Petrarca in Italy was saying that there was a renaissance going on. He said that there was a, uh, a golden age of classical antiquity with Greeks and Romans being good at stuff, columns, very good at columns, the Romans. Um, when they got good at it, they put leaves on the top, so they were Corinthian columns. And then, of course, it all got ruined uh, by, by, by vandals and uh, goths and people like that. Well, one doesn't like to say. One doesn't like to say. Um, and uh, Petrarca viewed his own time as a time of the rebirth of classical learning. In the 1830s, a fellow called Jakob Burkhardt, who was Swiss, was a student at a university not too far from here, but not this one. Burkhardt said, now said, Burkhardt wrote big fat books, which talked about this renaissance. And there are a lot of people who believe him and believe that there is a discontinuity between the Middle Ages, the Dark Ages, the Middle Ages, 
and the Renaissance. And when I studied Renaissance studies uh, many years ago at the University of Toronto, I studied with a professor who was an anti-Burkhardian. Anti-Burkhardian, his name was Weltmann. And Weltmann said that there was no discontinuity. If you look at 12th century art, 13th century art, 14th century art, you see continuous change. People did not wake up one day and say, hey, people don't look like that. People look like that, right? People didn't change the art like that. The literature didn't change like that. And I suggest that fighting did not change like that. Why do I think I need to say this? When I look at the Valpurgis manuscript, I see people fencing like that. But when I look at the Italian edition of Giacomo de Grassi, I see people fencing like that. Interesting. When I look at, there's a particular volute crater in the British Museum that shows Achilles. And in one, on one side of the vase, Achilles is fencing with a, on both sides with a spear. On one side, he's fencing with a spear and he's doing this. On the other side, he's fighting with a sword and he's doing this. The, now, I'm not saying that there was no change in the way people fought between this five, uh, fifth century BCE vase, Greek classical period, period vase, and the Valpurgis manuscript, um, 133, Royal Armories 133, but one of the things that I observe is that in this um, classical version and in this medieval version, we see people fighting with their shoulders forward, with their um, uh, buckler forward or a shield forward, and with a sword forward, and I view that as, I will call that, the classical approach to fighting. But we start to see in the 16th century, people start to fight with their shoulders further back. Now, I'm a technological determinist, so when I read some suggesting that they do that because the sword is longer, they can move their shoulders back and still strike. Maybe I believe that. However, I'm not going to attach direct cause and effect to that right now, because this is a fencing seminar and not a 16th century technology seminar. Instead, what I will observe is that when I went through the films, the videos, of the finals of Swordfish, Rapier and Dagger, for about five years, I saw everybody fighting like this, and nobody fighting like this. That is uh, and that's why I think this is worth discussing. So here we are approaching the question of rapier fighting, rapier and dagger fighting. And I want to bring in the idea that although there are pragmatic fencers who find that they win fights in a very competitive environment like swordfish. Does everyone know what swordfish is? 
um, they win fights with their backs upright, fighting in a way that de Grassi would approve of. There are other ways to fight, and they can be at least as effective, if not more so. So today my aim is to open up Salvatore Fabris to us and um, uh, and enable us to get some of the physicality and the body mechanics of Salvatore Fabris to touch Achilles and, uh, and the way that Achilles was represented, not in his own time, but 200 years later during the Greek classical period, and give us the option of different ways of fighting with a rapier and dagger. Question. Sir. So the question is about protective equipment and how protective equipment interacts with fencing in general, and also it's specifically with respect to the way Fabris shows us to fence. And we will all see a little bit more as we go about how Fabris shows us to fence. And also, uh, but also, your, your right to ask, first of all, the difference between having a sharp rapier and a, 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 a blunt rapier. And then the question, what about a mask? And then the question, what about other protective equipment? Um, first of all, Fabris is very clear as many Renaissance, ah, I said Renaissance, as many Renaissance fencing masters are, that he is delivering skills that will win combat with sharp weapons where life and death are at stake. And yet we also know that Fabris was the, uh, the, the fencing master to the king of Denmark. And we, we, we think maybe, and ask me whether or not you think this is the case, that he didn't kill the king of Denmark. And that every morning the king of Denmark would come in and he would do a lot of warm-ups, uh, very much like we did with Guy earlier. And then they would pick up swords and not kill each other. So there is the combined context of training to fence with some understanding that we were not going to kill each other. And then the idea that when you were swaggering down the street in Padua or Bologna and somebody grew on you, you would be able to, uh, to draw and, 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 and succeed in a fight. All of this without a 1600 Newton mask, because nobody had those in the 16th century. Um, so it changes the way people fight. Fabris tells us, and some of you will have seen uh, the references to uh, Richtenauer that I put on the, uh, the website, um, that some of you will, will not have. Fabris tells us to fight, and I'll come back to this, with our body as far as possible from our opponent, our shoulders as close as possible to our opponent, our head, the best armored part of our body, closest to the opponent, but we don't want to get hit in the face, do we? I only have two eyes, right? Two fights. After the second fight, I can't see very well anymore. So we have the, uh, the, uh, the unspoken motto, not in the face, so I have to cover my face with my health. So what is the difference then between, so, so what is the difference between fighting at swordfish and, uh, and, and fighting um, in the streets of Padua or, or uh, uh, Elsinore Castle in, in Denmark? Uh, one difference is that you have the luxury at, at Swordfish of the 1600 Newton mask. So perhaps that is why I can fence like this. But there isn't a direct link. I would expect people to be readier to fight like this if they have a 1600 Newton mask. So you ask valid questions. And I think that we will have to consider that as we go. Because most of us will fence in a mask. 
um, we'll have to consider how that influences. And your point about uh, the extent to which that might be uh, harder to see um, and whether a mask and a gorget would impede that is something we'll have to experience as we go. Other questions? Madame. Yes, all of that is very significant. So the question was, how does the context of representing um, combat, athleticism, uh, the human form in art change? Uh, and interestingly, when we look at the Valpurgis manuscript, when I talk about Valpurgis manuscript 133, you all know what I mean? Okay, when I talk about that manuscript, we see some what are for medieval um, art, fairly realistic representations of the way people stand and move, but they are subject to the conventions of medieval art. We think that it is entirely possible that a monk drew the Valpurgis illustrations, but interestingly, there's a woman in, uh, in Israel who specializes in um, armored combat, not armored combat, armed combat illustrations in Hebrew manuscripts. And there's the possibility that there were non-monastic illuminators painting manuscripts. Um, and, and it could be that they were also involved in painting um, the Valpurgis. And then we look at, uh, we go um, 14, 15, 16, we go 200, 300 years later, and we see very different styles of representation. The representation is different in different books. If you look at the Italian edition of De Grassi, we see a fairly carefully drawn, probably expensive illustrations of people looking very Italian and standing a certain way. If we look at the English edition of De Grassi, from 1594, I think, 1590, 1594. I'm very bad at dates, which for a historian is a problem. Um, we see much more crude illustrations. They are not precise. They are, they are, their beauty is in a different, uh, in a different way. I don't want to be a, a Philistine and say they aren't beautiful, but they are not precise. And, um, and then we look at it, Fabris's illustrations. There is, uh, I, for, for years, have been using an English translation of Fabris um, by Tom Leone. And there is going to be a new uh, translation into English, as a result of which there have been new scans of the Fabris illustrations at much better resolution. And you can buy those, um, you can buy them on Amazon. And uh, it's a, a large format, and you can see the format, and you can see the tremendous precision of the Fabris illustrations. Fabris invested a great deal in paying somebody a lot of money to draw those illustrations. We think that he was involved in, uh, in creating those illustrations, but there are people who will say, so here's me fencing Fabris, right? Actually, here's me to fight usually fencing Fabris. <laughs> but here's me trying to do all the right things. And there are people who say, that's not what Fabris taught. Fabris taught that you fence upright like everybody else. But when you hit, you do that. And when we see those illustrations, we are not seeing what happens at the beginning of the fight. We are seeing what happens at the end of the fight. We are seeing the last half a second when the, uh, when the, the, the fighter's body position changes and the sword goes in. So your point about illustration is apt and the context of illustration is apt. We have to bear that in mind as we interpret these documents, all of these documents, the text and the illustration. Does that address your point? Excellent. Fabris was born in Padua, 
in Italy in 1644. And by 1680 or 1690, he was a court fencer. 15. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Uh, 1544. And by, by 15, um, uh, 1580 or 1590, we see that he is in Northern Europe. And by 1590, he is, a, uh, he is the court uh, fencing master um, in Denmark. And he ends up also uh, uh, later on in, uh, in Germany. Of course, the, the line between Germany and, and Denmark was different before Bismarck. So, uh, so we, have to, uh, we have to think about him as being working in a Germanic environment, in a Northern European environment. And towards the end of his, he dies in 1618, which is how we know that he wasn't born in 1644. Uh, he dies in 1618. And um, in his latter years, he publishes his book. And the book is the retirement plan. The book enables him, as he gets old and creaky, to continue to earn even if he can't run the, uh, run the fencing workshops. So publishing was important for him professionally, and it's clear from his investment in the book that he is seeking to create a different approach to fencing, very different from, say, Lichtenauer. Right? Lichtenauer does not want you to be able to buy the book and fence the fence. He wants you to come to his lectures and pay him, and the book is, is, an, is a visual aid, because like me, he didn't have a slide projector to... Uh, on the screen. But Fabris clearly intends for you to buy the book and learn the fencing. And of course, this is uh, 60 years after Gutenberg. He is able to print his book and, and sell it across Europe in hundreds of copies. We see that Fabris becomes very popular across Northern Europe, and he remains popular across Northern Europe for um, uh, uh, until the end of the 17th century. And people who are fencing rapier still in, uh, in 1690 are, are using his methods in Northern Europe. And Reiner von Nort has published uh, a number of critical editions of other manuscripts in the Fabris tradition, including manuscripts that are, that are handwritten and hand-drawn, which give us an idea of how Fabris evolved going forward. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about what we're going, to, uh, how we're going to do this and what we're going to do. I'm going to check my notes, because otherwise I make stupid mistakes, like saying that Fabris was born in 1544. I also have pictures, if you... Uh, 16, thank you. 16, see? This is what happens if I don't work from my notes. Um, I also have, uh, have pictures, if you, if you want to look afterwards at the pictures of Achilles and all that, we can, I can show you that afterwards. Key concepts in Fabris. First, do not allow your opponent to find your sword. Do not allow your opponent to find your sword. Other key concept I want to bring forward is use both weapons together. He starts with rapier, single rapier, as m many people do. He comes to rapier and dagger, and it's important to use them together. Now, there are many beautiful illustrations of naked men in Fabres. And they're very athletic, very fit naked men. And I apologize for not being able, again, to show you pictures. But I'm not going to take us through the illustrations one by one. I'm just going to give some of the general principles. And one is, as I said before, you know, I, I say that uh, we're going to 
keep our head and shoulders towards our opponent, our squishy middle bits away from our opponent, because if you get hit here in 1644 or 1544, you're going to die slowly and horribly for two weeks of peritonitis. So you keep that away. In order to do this, when we look at the illustrations, we see that the fighters have all popped their hips and they've moved down as though they're about to do a deadlift. Yeah? So they are, um, their spine is neutral. They're not, they're not doing a snatch. Their spine is neutral. Their hips have gone to the back of the room. And they're very stable over, uh, over their feet. Although there is an argument whether this is actually designed to create a creative instability, to move off of that stability. I have a rapier, I have a dagger. You can see I have a, a long rapier. And uh, uh, Fabris is optimized to a long rapier. Harder to swing around, I keep hitting the ground. Uh, so I'm mostly going to thrust. And in most of the plates, we'll see that the rapier, uh, sorry, the dagger point is about 20% back from the tip of the rapier, and close to contact or in contact. When the dagger is withdrawn, we have it in contact either with the hilt or with the point. And you can see that as I move, I start to stand up again, because I first started to learn to fence from Degrassi, uh, and I'm lazy. Um, but the sword and the dagger are always in contact. I find this very difficult, very difficult indeed. My sword and dagger want to drift apart, and I call this the highway to hell, because when my sword and dagger drift apart, I get popped in the grill. So that is, let me just make sure I'm not leaving, leaving anything out here. That's it. Okay. We're going to do some exercises. Now that everybody's cooled off and we're no longer feeling all warmed up, we're going to do some exercises. We'll do them here on the grass. So, um, bring, uh, well, kit up, and kit up as though you're fencing. So, Wear whatever you're going to wear. We'll start off slow, but then we'll, we'll, we'll come to some actual fencing. All right, so put on your masks, chest protectors, jackets, the law. Everybody is very far away from me. Rightly so. I'm very fierce. Um, I will try not to shout, because if I shout, then my voice won't last very long. Ah, that's very nice. Thank you. We're going to start with a, um, a very straightforward partner drill. And the partner drill is going to be based on the idea of posture and counter posture. Posture and counter posture. In, uh, in Fabris's first book, he is open to the idea that for one posture, there is another posture. If one, if one opponent, if the agent takes up a posture, the patient should take up an, uh, an opposing posture. In the second book of Fabris, he says, stop posing. Stop taking up postures. That's how you get killed. In the second book of Fabris, he says, he says when you're going to fight, you draw your weapon, and stick it in the other guy right away before they kill you. But in the first book, he is open to the idea of posture and counter posture. And if you square up to your opponent, we'll do this in a moment, but I want to talk about it first. You square up to your opponent, and you give your opponent your head, 
and you get yourself right down as though you're about to do a deadlift, and you put your blade forward, then your dagger must be withdrawn here or here, or you can do it with your blade, uh, uh, with your dagger blade forward and your sword withdrawn. What I'd like to see you do is take up the one, and then when you're, when the agent will, will go in pairs, when the agent takes up one posture, the patient will respond with the other posture. So, before we go in pairs, everybody take a sword in your right hand. If it is a rapier, or something that is slightly chunkier than a rapier. And everybody has a dagger, or some other piece of hardware in their hand, a second rapier. All right. My class on Docciolini and the case of rapiers is, is not today. Um, so we have a rapier and a dagger, even if it looks like a long rapier. Now let's pop our hips to the back of the room and feel that stability around the legs there. All right, in about, in about five minutes, you'll want to stop. Yeah. And now cover your face with, your, with the cage of your hilt and advance your dagger to touch. Now take your right leg back, refuse your um, rapier, keep the hilt in front of your face, and have the point here 20% back from the tip. And then you see suddenly you're standing up. Oops, we've got to stay down. Okay. Now pick a partner. Everybody pick a partner. If you haven't got a partner, lift up your sword so that people can see you're available. We'll start out without striking, so we'll start out without masks. Okay. Now in each pair, one person will be agent. Agent acts. Patient responds. So briefly, decide between you who will start as agent. All right. So what we're going to do in this first very simple exercise is that agent will take up a posture. That one, or that one, you can do that too. Um, and patient will take up the other one. So agent, take up one, close the highway to hell, and patient, take up the other one. If the, uh, sorry, take the other pose. If the agent has the sword advanced, then go with your dagger advanced. If the agent has the dagger advanced, go with the sword advanced. Now change. Agent, change. Agent, take the other posture. If you have your dagger forward, put your sword forward. Patient, respond. Patient, if you haven't already. If agent has their sword forward, put your dagger forward. Now, agent, change. Now, pause and think about where your, where your body is. Let's get our, get our bodies right back down there. And agent, change. If the dagger is back, put the sword 
back. If the sword is forward, put the dagger forward. Yeah. Yes. Do a, yes. Yeah, you, you, you. Dagger foot forward. Yes. And if the sword, please. Then you put your sword foot forward. Yes. Great. Okay. Stand up. Shake it out a little bit. And draw closer for a moment. So, if you didn't already understand why there are some people who say that Fabris means for you to fight like this and then just do this for about half a second, now you know why. Be saving energy. Fabris says it is hard to fence like this. And when you look at the illustrations, the people in the illustrations are like this. They are. Their upper bodies are, their spines are parallel to the ground. And he's right. It is hard to do this. And he says, Fabris says, if you can't do this, then you can do this. Um, and so it's demanding. But remember, and this speaks to the, one of the questions we had earlier, remember, that it's demanding, but it keeps your weapons close to your opponent, and it keeps your guts far from your opponent. So it's hard, but it will save your life in a real fight. Can't ask better than that. OK. What we're going to do next is we're going to take the idea of standing with your dagger forward or your sword forward, and we're going to turn that into an exercise in finding your opponent's sword. We're going to have agent. Agent is going to stand, stand, is going to stand um, with dagger, sorry, sword advanced, Dagger forward, 20% back from the point. Patient is going to stand exactly the same way. So dagger forward, 20% back, and, uh, and the sword hilt covering your face, but not blinding you. And Agent is going to try to find patient's sword with either their sword or their dagger. So you're going to try to find your, patient, your opponent's sword with the blade or that blade. Does that make sense? When you're going to find the sword, what does that mean? What advantage do you seek when you find the sword? Feeling it, touching it, controlling it. Control comes from gravity. If your sword is above your opponent's sword, you have more control. It comes from edge, true edge against flat, or true edge against false edge. It comes from edge. And third advantage for control comes from strong, over weak, forte over debole, and your dagger is all forte, it's all strong. So we're going to put on masks, we are going to square off against opponents, we're going to take all the space we need, and we are going to try to find our opponent's sword, achieve advantage, with a dagger or with uh, or with your with your sword, see how that feels. No striking yet. Okay, hats on. 
so agent is going to agent is going to seek the opponent's blade, and then we'll switch and we'll switch who's agent and patient. The patient will be presenting the blade, and uh, and and you can move a little bit, but right now it's just going to be presenting a blade. Nope. Yeah, you can move. You can move laterally a little bit. You can move. Nope. You just allow, you present a, a, a rapier for your opponent to find. Who are you going to fight with? In a three? Great. A break, break, stand where you are, listen in. We are now going to do the same thing. Patient is just going to present a rapier and dagger in an appropriate stance. Feel the burn. Agent is going to seek the opponent's rapier Find the opponent's rapier with advantage. What are the advantages? Gravity, true edge, and strong over weak. And you're going to press the advantage by striking. So agent is going to seek, find, and strike. Do that five times and then switch agent and patient. Seek it, find it, and strike with your rapier. Does that make sense? Okay, crack on. Break. Right, hats off. If you need water, grab your water, but come close. Observation. What do you observe from these interactions? What do you observe about this way of engaging with a rapier and dagger just to find and exploit in a very simple exercise? Right? So you're here and you can take a step, you can take a step, but there's no, there's no lunge from there, is there? Yes. Yes. Always. Yes. What's interesting is that when we look at the crater in the British Museum, when Achilles is... <laughs> and when we look at the illustrations in Fabris, we often see people are doing this and getting stabbed. It is a natural response, but it is also sometimes a way to get hit. Which, so we can come to grips with that going forward, but it's useful observations. Other observations? It's pretty hard. Uh, Sorry. Sorry. Might just be the rapier dagger thing. I don't know what to parry. There's just too much steel in front of me. Yes? <laughs> and there, there are, when you first start to fight rapier and dagger, having, especially if you're a long sworder or if you're used to uh, even a side sword and buckler, the idea of having two weapons instead of a weapon and a parrying device can be very distracting and very complicated. Um, that comes with practice, but one of the things that you can do as you come into rapier and dagger 
is allow yourself to think of the dagger as more like a buckler, more of a parrying device uh, rather than a, um, a weapon as such. But as we go forward, what I suggest you do is think about your hand going forward to find your opponent's um, uh, rapier blade and seek the advantage as though it's your hand and as though you're using the cross of the rapier as fingers, yeah? So you've got three fingers, uh -huh. think about this as using the, using the cross of the rapier as a set of fingers to seize and hold the opponent's rapier, mm -hmm. all right? Uh, you had yeah, a point, sir. To a very similar question. I find it pretty hard not to tangle if I keep contact, not to cross it and get caught in the middle, for example. Yes. So, so I take a lot of pains <laughs> keeping this in this way and not going like this. Yeah, I mean, you can, you, you can slide your blade back, but then it's not out there in front doing its job. Yes. And uh, so something that you might do is give a little bit of space to uh, between them, a little, no, no, there, there, there we go, a little bit of space so that they don't get caught up quite the same. Sir? I noticed that um, because my opponent is also very, because the, the dagger is off, like 20% in front of me. Yeah. And when I uh, get the binding, I often have both blades bind. So, so I could move yeah. both blades to the side to get my uh, rapier in. So this was interesting because with rapier fighting on the side, it's just okay, you get just the. Uh, to uh, the main weapon, and then you have to take the dagger uh, away. But in, in this, it was quite easy to get both blades out of the way to, to get my attack. Uh, because you've got two hands uh, yeah. doing the pushing. Yeah. There is a technique that we see um, in, in Fabris where uh, you can be at misura larga, long measure, and you can take your opponent's blade on your rapier then come up and take it with your dagger and then hit, which enables you to seize your opponent's blade from misura larga. And in fact, you can start out, out of measure, get your opponent's blade by moving into misura larga and then move in and, and take, your, take your opponent's blade, which is another version of that. Very useful. Other points? Okay. What we're going to do next is a little bit more interactivity. So agent and, well, agent and patient will start out of measure. So before you do this, you and your opponent look at what your measure is. Look at misura, let me borrow your enormous blade here for a moment. Look at Misura larga, uh, sorry, misura stretta, so being able to hit by inclining the body, and look at misura larga for each of you, then move out of measure, move out of misura larga. You can stand comfortably, you can do anything you want because you're out of measure, and then agent moves into measure, and Fabris says, when you come into measure, make yourself small. That's the, 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 uh, the phrase he uses. Make yourself small, and agent, seek your opponent's rapier. Patient, also make yourself small, and present the rapier. And then once agent finds your rapier, agent strikes, do it five times, and then switch. Okay? Crack on. Raise your sword. If you're just agent, raise your sword. Hold it up. Right. Patience. Switch. Find a new agent. Agents, keep your sword up. We've got an agent here who needs a patient. 
Right, form of three with these guys. Especially for I'd like to see two cues. I would like to hear a cue of everybody who is fully kitted out. Jacket, uh, mask, uh, chunky gloves, right? Here we go. Somebody who's fully kitted out, right? So you've got a jacket, you've got throat protection, you've got face protection. Everybody who's got that level of protection, form a cue here. And everybody who is who has not got that level of protection, if you just have a mask and gloves, form a cue here. Excellent example. We have a shirt, and we have breeches, and we have a mask. So everybody, yeah. I recognize that this is not England. Yeah. But I need to see a cue. <laughs> <laughs> we are going to fight as king of the hill with two pigs. When I say king of the hill, does that make sense? Yeah. All right, I heard a no. So a king of the hill, one person stands here in on a piece, and one by one, everybody comes and fights. Whoever wins holds the field. Whoever loses goes to the back of the queue. So we'll cycle through the queue. Sir? The doubles? <laughs> uh, doubles are refought on the spot. So just continue as though nothing happens. Fight out the double till you have a resolution. <laughs> now, everybody who's watching needs to keep an eye on the on the fencers and needs to remind the fencers if they're in measure they need to be right down there flexed and fighting properly if they start to get into that degrassi saviolo yeah standing up fighting from here and say down <laughs> let me hear it Oh, excellent. So keep an eye on the on the people fencing in front of you and help them remember when they come into measure, they make themselves small. Down. All right? You're going to marshal this. Uh, I'm going to marshal this one. We're, and let, we'll keep it brisk. We'll cycle through so everybody gets a lot of fighting, okay? Hold the field. Hold the field. Ready? Back. lesson, we all stand in a circle, and we go around the circle, and everybody says, 
the best thing they learned in the lesson, the best experience in the lesson, and then they say what they want to work on to improve for the next lesson. And if they're very clever, they will then take out their fencing notebook and they will write down what they, uh, what they enjoyed most and what they must work on for the next lesson. Now, we have a lot of people here. It would be an entire other lesson for us to talk about what, we, um, what everybody liked best and what everybody will take away for the next lesson. But I know that when I'm standing in the circle and it's not my turn yet, I'm thinking, oh my God, what am I going to say? What am I going to say? What's the best thing? And what am I going to work on? So everybody, imagine that right now we're going around the circle and you're, you're going to be at six, and then at five, and then, at, and then it's going to be your turn. So think about the best thing and think about what you're going to work on for next time. And not everybody has to say this. But who wants to give us a best thing? The best thing about learning about Sally Fabris. Um, I feel quite protective in the stands because I had a lot of steel in front of me to, to work with. So I will take because in the other sides I'm, I feel more open. Right. This is more protective. So there is a feeling of protection which, if you're going to worry about fighting in real life with somebody with a sharp point, is going to stick. Very important. Isn't it? Well, to me, it's uh, very short compared yeah. to most other fighters. So I think it's a very I feel like it's a very appropriate technique for me to make it an advantage for me against larger opponents. Yeah, my my daughter is about your height, and she um, she got the nickname the oil slick because she flows across the ground and then stabs up into your face. Um, that's, so it is absolutely right to observe that people who can't loom over, can be deaf from below. Excellent. So. An interesting part of the arm, because um, if someone is stabbing in like this, this situation, I have my arm on top of me, I can't hide behind my arm. And um, even if I have a little bit of cloth, I won't be hurt. And I can maybe grab or get knees the point. Mm -hmm. So I have much more protection. So when you are, um, because you're keeping your opponent at arm's length, you can, in fact, even using the quillens on your on your hilt, you can grab their blade and control it when they do that. A useful observation. Now, what are we going to work on for next time? For next time we Physics. go to, I'm sorry? Physically, body strength, keep my arm up. This is a thing, this is a thing, a, a, a long rapier, at full extension for a long fight really 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 weighs on you. So yeah you've got you've got so yeah you've got you've got to uh, you've got to put in the gym time to work this work on this. What else? What are we gonna work on for next? Sorry that No no please um you use the possibility to strike Approaching um, your opponent small steps, yes, exactly. you keep the balance point at the center of you, and yeah, your arse have to be somewhere you had <laughs> yeah. to make it balance. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. It is now the most sacred time of the day. <laughs> it is lunch time. <laughs> Thank you so much for your attention.